Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. And I'm very excited for today's conversation. It feels like a long-awaited, anticipated, very excited opportunity to connect with Jake Gutman and Joel Cohen. We have Rosevest Financial here and True North Advisors as well. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for Appreciate having us. it. Did I botch last names or did I do okay? No, that was great. <laughs> I think we got in your head prior. I, think it's I know. I yeah. think so, right? So before we kick off the show, I want to make sure that I read a disclaimer. It's always important when we have friends from uh, regulated industries. So for Jake and the company, we want to make sure that uh, it's understood that securities and advisory services offered through Genios Wealth Management Incorporated, member F-I-N-R-A-S-I-P-C. We took care of that. Fin Recipic. Fin yeah. Recipic. I yeah. should I should know how to do that because I've done it enough times for That's some of okay. our clients That's okay. who are in the financial It'll never industry. Go away, no, it won't. And thank goodness yeah. for that, right? Yes. It helps keep us where we need to be. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we've been talking about this episode for a, a little while now via email, and I'm very excited to get to know each of you. So we always like to start off our conversation with you, both of you introducing yourselves. Tell us a little bit about you and your profession and then the company and the organization that you represent, and then we'll get into the meat of the conversation, who you serve and what does that look like, and of course, most importantly, how is that different? Are you okay starting for us? Absolutely, no problem. So my name is Joel Cohen. Uh, I'm the president of True North Advisors uh, out of out of Gilbert. Um, And we work primarily with marketing marketing advisory services as well as operations uh, services as well. So think of a virtual CMO, a virtual COO. That's really where we focus most is just helping executives when it comes to understanding how to best apply marketing skills and other things in their businesses. And is there a particular industry or industries that you most like to work with? I'm assuming that's the case. Well, it depends. It's funny because we're very diverse, right? And so one of the things that I like about that is that we learn something new all the time with the the clients that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, We're in anything from the financial industry to pretty heavy in tech with some businesses out of Michigan and in New York. We work with Broadway shows. There's a lot of different components of what we get to work with, and that keeps my life interesting, I think. I didn't know that. So I was making an assumption it was going to be really kind of singular, but very vast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. all over the place, really. And it's it's interesting in the sense that, you know, you you very quickly get to learn those types of businesses. As a quick example, we did a Christmas rock and roll show throughout the entire United States. I, I can't say which one. I'm sure everybody can guess which one, but... And it was just incredible because you learn so much about what it means to change every single night and go out and run a new show. Yeah. So that, that keeps life interesting. That sounds fascinating. And how did you find your way to this role? So I've either owned agencies or been a partner at an agency for the last, boy, 14, coming on 15 years, which is pretty crazy. And really what it came down to is during the pandemic, we were the agency that I was a part of then. My, my partner and I were very heavy in the Uh, health in hospitality space. And the health side was okay. Hospitality was terrible, obviously. I mean, everything shut down. And there was just a kind of an epiphany during that time for me where I just decided, you know what, this is, I want to be able to branch out and help people at the level that I have been helping them. uh, But I don't want to produce digital ads anymore. And I don't want to do those things myself. I I really want to try to, to work with them from a strategy perspective. And that's what I do with Jake. And that's what I do with, with, with several other clients. And it has been wonderful. And and growing. And growing. Absolutely. Very rapidly. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting. Well, congratulations to you. Oh, I appreciate it. Jake, introduce yourself for us, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Jake Gutman, and I am, you know, I'm not a huge title person, but founder and CEO, I guess you could say, for Rosevest Financial. Uh, Rosevest is a privately owned, it's essentially a, a family owned and family inherited business that I took over in 2017. We've been in the industry since 1986 and practicing under multiple different names as a actual wealth advisory firm since 2001. So we came in, uh, we act as a, essentially a, in the same way Joel works as a private CMO for companies, I work as a private CFO for clients. So it might be someone that is building up wealth. It might be someone that has amassed a large amount of wealth, but our role is to essentially place our clients in the best possible position for every major life event. So that might mean, unfortunately, death. It Mm -hmm. might mean, for most people, 
fortunately, marriage. There's a lot of different triggering events that bring us to these places, but we currently serve uh, about 300 families across the country. We're very lucky, just like Joel. I have a lot of diverse clients from everything from school teachers to business owners to government employees, you name it. We have at least some experience working in that category, and we have a lot of great partners that help us do it. It was a family business before you even grew into that. Sure. Did yeah. you? Were you always destined to do that? It depends who you ask. Uh, me? <laughs> yes. No. For me, I actually spent most of my time growing up thinking I was either going to be a G.I. Joe in real life or a firefighter or a police officer or something like that, paramedic. Yeah. In fact, I was probably one of two of my friends, maybe, that didn't go join the Marine Corps after high school. Interesting. So I went to U of A. I did economics and psychology. Uh, they went off and joined the Marine Corps, the Navy, all of that. I was actually actively talking to Navy recruiters in college. I hated the idea of sales. I hated the idea of sitting at a desk all day. And a strange culmination of events that I'm, I'm sure we'll get into later kind of led me back to the family business. And that business was what's a whirlwind. A whirlwind, I think, is a fair way to put it. Yeah, the last five years have been just chock full of exciting and stressful and interesting things. So, um, you know, you ask my father. Yeah, I was destined He for always this. knew. Yeah. <laughs> you ask myself and perhaps my mother. Absolutely not. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Such great introductions from both of you. Thank you. I'd love to hear the backstory on the names of your businesses as well. Do you have a story too? I do. Yeah. I mean, the, the business itself is is... As we sat and just, well, what's funny is that it came through a random na name generator. So that's, I don't want it to seem like that takes away from it, but. But sometimes we have to do that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, inspiration and creativity is not something that I'm necessarily great at. I mean, the inspiration side, but I, I think that we just sat there and we were running through things and True North came up and I instantly started thinking that's exactly what we were set up to do, which is to help people understand exactly where they are within their, their marketing journey, yeah. apply data and analytics to make sure that they're very clear on where they stand and regardless of whatever the reaction is going to be to how they're doing where what is truly happening with the business and help them with the strategy to get them in the place they want to go it's a perfect name <laughs> i love it yeah it's great and how about rose fest that's been around for as long as the company's been around no and um not a random name generator on that one <laughs> no. I, I didn't know that actually yeah not a lot of people um don't. so we actually, we started off as, I think it was Nationwide Planning and Benefits back in 2001. Eventually, it evolved into Gutman Financial Group. And then when I took over uh, about a year and a half into the transition, I renamed it. And it took me at least a year and a half, maybe two years to figure out what I wanted that name to be. That was actually a big stressor for me. Sure. You know, despite me being here on the radio, podcast, whatever you want to call it, I'm not the kind of person that likes being the center of attention. I'm sure Joel can attest to that. So for me, I wanted to take my name off the wall and put something else that was bigger on the wall. You know, like many interesting ideas, I think the idea came to me. And at the time, the marketing team I was using after a couple of old fashions at Hillstone and at the Biltmore. So that loosened things up a little bit to think of some good names. And one of the things they asked me was, who's, you know, a big inspiration in your life? You know, what what is it that kind of drives you to be the person you are? For me, it was a surprisingly easy answer. It wasn't a mom or dad in this case. I love them both to death. But it was actually my grandmother, Rose. Um, so Joel has been a huge part of this story. He's actually helping us put together, um, well, we can talk about that yeah. in a little bit, but um, a family history, essentially. So the general idea is this, you know, when I was 13 or 14 years old, much like you guys probably, I was going to school. My biggest concern was, sorry, puberty, maybe something else along those lines. What the hair looked like. I have a 14-year-old oh, yeah. boy, by the way, mm. who is longer in the bathroom than I think I ever was. Oh, I was a pretty boy at a certain point. <laughs> I don't know why. I didn't look pretty. I had glasses and braces and it was... But that nightmare. age, you're only thinking about social stuff and how mm. much fun and yeah. I don't have to say yeah. you look pretty now, though. I'm just going to throw you. that out. Plastic surgery does wonders now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dr. Goldfarb. <laughs> and so when my grandmother Rose was 13 or 14, she was actually checking into Auschwitz in, in Germany. So, you know, we can sit here and talk about different stories and those kind of things. But my grandmother at age, I think it was 13, was in Auschwitz and then eventually Bergen-Belsen. So she was actually the only surviving member of her family. Uh, my grandmother, you know, we, I'll, I'll spare you the real big details and maybe we'll get into that later because Joel and I have been kind of 
accumulating data, mm -hmm. if you will. But my grandmother actually pulled teeth out of her entire family on the conveyor belts. So, you know, you, you talk about a person of strength, right? Well, and, and, and even just to take that a bit further, yeah. I mean, she, she had to pull the teeth out of her, one of her uh, cousins that, that mm -hmm. was pregnant. Yeah. I think Forgive she was me for asking why, because I don't understand. First I of all, I had the answer. Do we, why was she Jewish? I, I know, but I mean, why? Why I don't know the understand so, the significance. Uh, oh, they, they were they were pulling and, and for identification. No, 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 no. no. They're Much pulling. Worse, the, they're, they're pulling the, um, the gold, gold and teeth. silver. They would melt oh. it down. So, yeah. oh, oh. my grandmother and they actually she met my grandfather Irving in a displaced persons camp. I think that was in the fifties. My grandfather's the kind of guy that makes you feel like your life is absolutely boring. I think he spoke seven languages. He escaped from Auschwitz in another camp. He fought the Germans with the Russians. He worked with European royalty and taught them ballroom dance in exchange for protection. So all this being said, my grandparents came to the United States with nothing, not even English. They went to Detroit. They had jars. It was rent, electricity, whatever, bills, right? And they would go without eating to feed other people that other that came over, immigrants. When, when you look back at Rose, right, all these things that took place, um, you know, she passed, uh, I think it was almost 10 years now, but she had night terrors until the day she got Alzheimer's. Oh, yeah. And yet every time she met someone, it was like they were the only person in the room. Well, and that has translated a lot into how you run your business, without a doubt. And that's, Clearly. and that's, you know, I think going back to kind of the why that we do the things that we do, right. you know, not not to to shift, but I mean, yeah. me being able to work with Jake is a is an honor, right? I mean, there's a lot that we, we've built a friendship. It's, Likewise, it's funny that that you know, my one of my past partners being friends with your clients is, was not allowed, right, at all. And you know, we've become very close over the time that we've known each other, not only from a business perspective, but also in kind of working through this journey of understanding what's what his grandparents had to go through, what his family had to go through. Um, his father came across a bunch of documents, uh, Germ German documents. And um, I said, you know what? I would love to, to put something together that kind of tells this whole story because yeah. it's nuts. I mean, it's crazy to hear Jake tell that story. And uh, my wife was born in Germany and speaks German. And, and she started to, to translate some of it. And we're putting together kind of this whole site related to before the war with his his grandparents yeah. during the war and then afterwards and how they achieved what they achieved because ultimately what they did to come to America with nothing after going through all of this challenge and everything else and then to have the family that they then created thrive the way that they have just yeah. speaks to I think uh, a different level of humanity and understanding and will and grace that very few people could ever understand and yeah. clearly putting people B ahead of Absolutely. right that that was the theme for both your grandparents oh, right yeah. always yeah. putting people ahead of being of service you know it, it's interesting sorry go ahead oh, i was just gonna say and that's something that jacob does except exceptionally well right. in, in the sense of of you don't run across from my perspective uh, a lot of financial advisors that are genuinely interested in what you want to have happen in your life like they want to know so that they can meet these certain data points at least that's been instead my instead of driving a product or something else like that absolutely mm -hmm. and um and so that experience of life and growing it is something that i've i've seen with jake sorry i interrupted you no no i appreciate it in the kind words um really joel nailed it on the head uh or hit the nail on the head it's everything from the first time we meet someone to how my staff answers the phone to I had a client come in my office the other day and one of my client relationship managers was actually sitting down and doing some paperwork with them. And he made a comment. He's, I think he's in his late seventies, early eighties now. And he said, man, I remember when you were in secondary school, you know, these are relationships we've had. I have, I can count, I would run out of fingers with people that I've known since I was probably 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my grandparents, everything they said, we try and emanate everything they did. Right. Um, Which is why, of course, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, whatever. It's why the marketing perspective, which is why we're here today, right, to represent and, mm -hmm. and shine this spotlight sure. on both businesses, but why this story and, and, and figuring out how to tell this story is so important because it is, to both of your points, the, the backbone of everything that you've developed your business over. And really how I've been raised. 
my grandparents, when they came over here, they, they did learn English. I think my grandmother, before she passed, spoke five languages. I can barely get through a Spanish conversation. <laughs> and barely English, if you ask my wife sometimes. Um, I think she's listening. Didn't throw her under the bus, I don't think. But they went on to create the first one deli. It was Irving's Delicatessen. And it was in, I think it was Hamtramck in Detroit, Michigan. They went on to have two others. They were extremely successful. My grandmother on Jewish holidays would cook thousands of meals for people that didn't even pay her. Um, she, kids would come in the restaurant and they'd learn how to make pickles. They had sandwiches. It was, this was the kind of place where you'd walk in and she'd say, shut up. I already know what you want. You know, do you want it this way or that way? <laughs> so that was how it was. And, yeah. you know, Joel and I are a part of a group called the Men's Arts Council. And we were actually at a mixer at, what is it, Lucky's? Mm -hmm. And there's a gentleman, uh, Remo. Mm -hmm. And Remo and I are talking and he's from Detroit. I can barely claim I'm from there. Okay. I moved when I was little. But we get to talking and I said, you know, that's crazy. You're from the same area. Have you ever been to Irving's Deli? And he goes, are you kidding me? And I said, no, I don't, I don't know what the joke would be. He said, I sharpened their knives for 10 years. Oh my gosh. I mean, we were on, I was on a boat in Venice, Italy. And, and one of the people on that boat had a Michigan accent and my dad started talking to him and he grew up going to the same deli at the same time. Oh my goodness. So that that's kind of, in a way, what I'm up against, right? I mean, that's like the internal challenge is... Keeping up with that bar yeah. is, it, it's, it's a lot to be done. What I love so much about being in here with both of you is I'm watching Joel's expression as you're telling those stories. And so I, maybe you've heard them all or maybe these last little two Probably ones are new. Probably a couple times. But what's so neat is, is the, the friendship, the, the understanding how important the depth of the family history is to not only the way you were raised, of course, but the way you do business. And shout out to mom and dad and grandparents, of course, and your wife. Can't forget your wife as well. Uh, but how incredibly important that is. I'm, I'm sensing that this, this isn't just Jake and Rosevest. This is how, I mean, the, this, of course, the story and the history and the family is unique. Everybody starts businesses for different reasons sure. at different times. But I'm sensing just already what I've gotten to know about you, uh, Joel, is that, that you're listening for those opportunities. What makes them unique and how we can, how we, can we help other people understand that so that they want to do business if they're a good fit? Well, I, and I think that a lot of it comes down to we're here temporarily, right? And at the end of it all, I want to be able to, to say, well, what did I do with my life? And being able to sit in position, you know, to say I made a difference in, in Jake's family's life it was cool. We were in Hawaii this past week. His his dad sent us. Uh, I don't know if I told you this or yeah. not. Yeah, um, I knew ahead of you. Okay, so I, <laughs> I got to know now. Tell yeah. us. But sent us a nice bottle of wine and some yeah. strawberries and some other things. And it's like you know we we've built some relationships and hopefully um, beyond the relationships that that we have built together. You know my. I look to accomplish so much more with Jake and in, in, in the sense of his growing family over time and the things that we're doing together to tell the story of, of Holocaust uh, families and, and survivors. And, you know, there, there's, there's a legacy component to what is done. And if I feel as though I can't incorporate and feel good when I go to bed at night about what I've done that day, then I won't do it. It's led to letting go of some very profitable clients in the past mm -hmm because I, I'm at a point in my life where I just want to enjoy it. But at the same time, it has led to incredible relationships. I feel the same about Business Radio X. I've only owned the studio for four years, and I haven't said no to many clients because most people I really resonate with. Sure. So, you know, we're obviously what we think about, what we bring about, and, and we can attract more. But same thing, I, this is a lifestyle business for me, and I want Daryl and I to spend time with people that really are doing good work in the world so that we can say that we get to be a part of that and help them achieve their goals. Yeah, and there's yeah. power in saying no. No, no's, for sure. No is a powerful word. <laughs> and, and like you, I've had to say no sometimes where it would have meant, you know, a, a different set of circumstances financially right away. But the, the payoff sure. comes later by standing in the power of that. Absolutely. And honestly, I think Joel's selling himself short, you know, uh, in the regard that, well, in many facets, right? I think he's great at what he does. But the entire concept of creating this essentially online library was actually Joel's brainchild. Right. I mean, this was something he came to myself mm -hmm. and my dad with and said, if it's OK with you, I'd like to do this. So it's not as if I went out and said, Joel, I want to hire you to build this website. This was something that he came up with. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so can you speak to that a little bit? Tell me about the library. 
Do you want to go and touch on that one? Sure. It yeah. Might be a little um, emotional for me on that one. It was. It was. It was amazing because we were over at at Jake's house and his dad was telling some stories. We were there and, and I forget what we were there for. Um, Jackson wanted to listen for a project. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. My son uh, was was wanting to listen to to some of the stories for something that he was doing at school. He had had several students that and faculty that uh, were denying the Holocaust, and so listening to um, some of the, of what started to take place, Jerry, who's, who's Jake's dad, and I started to really interact. And as we sat at the table, I just listened to some of what took place. I mean, it was, it's harrowing. And I think that sometimes that we forget what people have gone through. You know, we talk about the pandemic, we talk about some of the struggles that we've had overall as, as, a, as a country over the last four to six years. But let's not forget in the last hundred years, what what we have come through has been absolutely astounding. World wars and just uh, the, the civil rights movement and so many other things that have been equally, I think, difficult. And I don't, from my perspective, beyond the interest for, for Jacob's family, I don't want those messages to be lost right. and those things. There's another story that this brings up, but I, I in the interest of time, I'll, I'll maybe save it for later. But I just, we have to remember the struggle and that, and how real it was being torn from your home, torn from your family, put into a position where you don't know whether you're going to live each day. Doing unspeakable things. And then to come to America with nothing and to utilize a community to rebuild yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the standard to which we should set ourselves, I think, as as a country in many cases and say, that is a challenge, not the fact that I can't look at my phone for six hours or whatever it may be. <laughs> the anxiety inducing feeling of forgetting it somewhere. Right. Yeah. And we're, and we are up against a challenge with that. So thankfully we have business owners and professionals like you guys. And I, I think I'll put myself in there as well. And a good portion of the people that come through business radio X who have a similar privilege and opportunity to say, we can't forget and we have, we can do better. Right. Right. One of the shows we do is uh, STEM Unplugged, and it's with um, SciTech Institute and Arizona Tech Council uh, that focuses on K-12 education when it comes to STEM-related fields, right? Uh, And um, making sure that we go out to the rural areas and making sure that these kids have the same opportunities, some of our kids who are more privileged, like those kinds of things. If we don't remember our history lessons and don't remember the sacrifices that people made to come to the U.S., let alone to make U.S. the thriving country that it is, is then we're we're at risk you know i think that the i think all you have to do is travel the world a little bit to know how good we've got yeah. it you know a lot of the issues that we deal with here are are real and i don't want to detract from that mm-hmm. but go to a, a third world country um or go and, and and visualize what what's happening in china right now to get an understanding of how good we have it overall and again i think that it just takes stories like these and experiences like those to help remind us how lucky we are and to be grateful yeah. for yeah. the opportunities that we have just to be sitting here and doing the show with you as an example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky that my wife and I travel quite a bit and my in-laws are actually from the Philippines. So I think it was 2018, we went out there and spent two weeks and amazing country, amazing group of islands. And, and the same thing can be said for my, you know, my friends that tell stories about Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen or Syria that when they were on deployments. But I don't think to Joel's point, and of course there are extenuating circumstances here, people realize just how bad it can be in other places and the opportunities that happen here. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely people that are disenfranchised, don't have the same luck, you name it. But there is something beautiful about the story about someone who comes here with nothing. Forget my grandparents, just in general pulls themselves up by the bootstraps, if you want to use that phrase. I know that sometimes that gets beaten up these days and make something that they can be proud of. Mm-hmm. Doesn't I don't mean that from a financial perspective. I mean, I, I have clients that, I have one that comes to mind who moved here from Hiroshima, Japan. He's deep into his 80s. And if you do the math, that means he was there during the bombs, right? This man came to the U.S., him and his wife started a liquor store in Los Angeles, but he saved, he did the right things. He raised a family. His daughter lives in London. And he's one of the happiest people I've ever met. And that just, that speaks volumes to things. You know, it's funny you say that. The, it, the, the, the wealthier someone is, mm-hmm. the less happy 
they usually are. It's, it's, it's something that I have noticed in many, many circumstances. I think the problem's changed, right? It, it's suddenly, there's a couple different ways to go about that kind of conversation, right? There, there's some people or many people who accumulate wealth and they realize it didn't solve their problems. You now, you talked about spiritual healing and some things before this, right? If I was a terrible person before I was wealthy, something tells me I'm probably not going to improve just because there's more zeros in my bank account, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for some people that are philanthropic. I know, you know, you can talk about people all day long that have fortunes that donate a ton of things that just don't talk about it. It might not be on, you know, CNN or Fox or whatever it might be, but by all means, Joel, spot on. I mean, it's not a correlation. Mm -hmm. There is no correlation. But what you get to do in your profession is help people make the most out of their wealth. Absolutely. And and make sure that they're making the right, right choices, as you pointed out, just listening to their story. What is important to you? And let's find the best way to do that. Can, mm -hmm. can we, I want to make, this has been a fascinating conversation. We never know where these conversations go. Daryl, our producer and community <laughs> manager, teed that up for us. I want to make sure because I, I owe your organizations and the clients that you serve the opportunity to talk like business too. Sure. So we'll, if you're okay, sure. I yeah. kind of want to shift gears to make yeah, sure no I do that. So let's, let, since we're on the financial train, right? Sure. And we've been talking about generations is there a difference between baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Z? Like, are, is, are you seeing that there's a difference in what their motivation is and, and how they're spending and saving? And, and how are you serving that, that shift? I would say that there's a handful of huge differences. And I think, Joel, you can see this through the data, too. We talk about this, right? Younger generations are so much more invested in the idea of making a difference. And I shouldn't generalize, okay? I, look, there are people of all age groups yeah. that do this. The changes that are taking place are a bit experiential, right? These are young people now, let's say under the age of 45, are looking for an experience. They don't really care about the other parts of that. They want a great way of living. They want a number of different things, whether travel, huge one now. Travel's always been big, but I would say now more than ever, top of the conversation. College planning has been one that's changed quite a bit as university costs have gone up exponentially. Uh, you know, you look at the graph with inflation versus the cost of college, and it's not exactly uh, a pretty sight. But one of the most interesting things that I think is coming up, and Joel and I talk about this a lot, is that by 2030, one of the largest transfers of wealth in history is going to be happening, and that's the baby boomers passing down nearly $70 trillion to millennials. $70 trillion. And you're talking about people that are now aging, right? I mean, the boomers, there's a reason you see old folks' homes popping up on corners. There's a reason you see people living a lot longer than they used to. I mean, mortality tables are not the same as they used to be. I think it's all about the experience they want in their lives. An older client might have been more prone to say, I'll pay for my kids to go to college. Um, anything after that, it's on them. But of course, it's different for every person. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that there are a lot of young people now that say, I just want my kid to be happy. Whether it's trade school, mm -hmm. be a plumber. I know a lot of wealthy plumbers. Absolutely. I mean, these are all things that people forget about. Yep. You don't have to wear a tie to work to be successful. And so. we also have a deficit for a lot of the trades, oh, yeah. especially oh. the specialties. Oh, yeah. You're trucking. Yep. I mean, oh, yeah. these you can make $100,000 being a trucker. Mm -hmm. It just blows my mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a big shift that, you know, you talked about the great resignation before. I'm even seeing that with people in C-suite positions. Yes. It's not just the account executive, the entry-level position, mm -hmm. but I think there's a large awakening happening and a large change or shift happening in what people expect out of the place they show up to work for every day and what they expect out of their finances and retirement. So how does that influence the change in your industry? Uh, it's pretty radical. Um, I think that this is something you get to experience, Joel, just on the back end that you might be able to touch on too, but... I think we're finding that the days of the old school stockbroker, which I hate being called a stockbroker, it's like my least favorite thing, mm -hmm. are dead. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen anymore. I, I think for a thriving firm or a firm that wants to be thriving to succeed, they have to really reposition themselves as the guide for their clients. It's a partnership. It's, it's a huge difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not a sales pitch. In fact, you know, if you were to call maybe 10 of my clients right now and ask them if I'm ever salesy, the answer would probably be no. I want to educate you to the point where you're dangerous. 
And at that point, you can make that educated decision about what you want to do. It doesn't matter if it's $100,000, $1,000, or $100 million. That's something that I think is really important for a lot of these people. A brief story. I hopefully, I'm not always a brief storyteller, but my mom passed, oh, probably 15, 16 years ago. And my parents divorced long ago. My mom didn't have a lot of money. And we were estranged, all three of my other siblings and I were kind of estranged. But when my mom's financial advisor sat us down after she passed, the one thing he said to us was, your mom was not only a lovely person, which was hard for us to hear because we didn't have a relationship with her, but thrilled to hear that. And she, even though she had a meager income, she listened to everything that I taught her, came in and taught me things mm -hmm. because she was she wanted to to learn how to do it. And and this beautiful partnership between how they worked really inspired me to say, boy, do I need to become more financially literate? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's critical. I mean, if you truly, if you truly love someone, what better way to take care of them yep. than to make sure that no matter what, everything's taken care of. I mean, and I work with with Jake as he's our financial advisor. And one of the first things and steps that we walked through was, you know, making sure that we had planned for the kids and for worst case scenario, right? right? And it's not something that's a great topic. But, but you have to have that conversation. You, and a lot of people don't want to. Well, of course it's, they don't. It's a morality, or I'm sorry, a mortality thing. And it's it's interesting, right? Because for me, it's peace of mind. Like before we went on the trip, we finalized a, a, a three-month process of going through and creating and trusts and a new will and everything else. I mean, it was God, 300 pages probably all together with everything. And had we not gone and worked through some things with him, the what, what we had had previously would have done nothing. Mm -hmm. nothing. It was a lot of fluff. It was 80 pages of fluff. Like, right. Nothing. Yeah. And so, you know, this whole time we're thinking, wow, we, we took care of, of the kids. We've done everything that we need to do to make sure everything's set up. Only to find out. Only to find out it wasn't. And if something had happened, God forbid, at that point, we would have created a much worse scenario where oh, now yeah. I go to bed and I'm like, yeah, oh, you know, worst case, I know he's taken care of and I don't ever have to worry. I just talked to an attorney yesterday who's a dear friend and she said she's currently working on a $28 million probate, meaning nothing was done for that client. Nothing. Except Not Prince. a single... Uh-huh. Nigerian prince, yes. No, remember, but prince, oh, prince was a bad, yeah. Like 300 prince million was, or oh, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's actually, that's just one of many celebrities right. and large figures that had that issue. It, it's very commonplace. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I, I like to view it when I talk to my staff as rescuing people from their previous advisor. I'm not trying to take anyone. Uh, in fact, if you have a great relationship, I really don't want to break that. Yeah. It's really hard because for me, I want to work with Joel and his kids and his wife for 20, 30, however many years. You know, nowadays, maybe we'll live to 120. I don't know if I want to, but at that <laughs> but point. But they say it's possible. <laughs> hopefully I retire before then. Mm -hmm. That's really the big thing is I just want to make sure that even as we scale and we're doing so, I think, rather quickly. I think we've grown 20% year over year for the last five years. Mm -hmm. I never want my clients to feel as if they've lost that personal touch. And if they do feel that way, I want it to be expressed. Yeah. Well, clearly they would <laughs> because yeah. you – it, the, the the term family comes to mind and sometimes it's overused in business. But really, as you pointed out, you you care for the people that you're with. You want that open line of communication. You're modeling it and demonstrating it for them so that they can have those hard conversations. Yeah. There's a lot of apps out there right now, uh, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, do it for you. And is there a strategy that's necessary? Is that important? Or can we really, you know, look at Instagram and, and go, oh, this is the app for me and build wealth. Oh, geez. That. I look at this in the same way people look at WebMD. My mom, rest her soul. I don't know if she was a hypochondriac, but if she had a headache, that meant she had brain cancer according to WebMD, mm -hmm. right? I mean, everything, if she stubbed her toe, it had to be amputated according to WebMD. My problem is not in a, a point of utility because it's great to have the use for all these things. My problem starts way earlier than the apps. It's in the education. You know, nowadays, I, I don't know about you guys, but I left knowing how to talk about the structure of a cell in biology in school. But other than having a financial planner as a father, I couldn't even tell you how to write a check. So how are we supposed to be set up to do these things, let alone on our own, if I don't even know what the heck my 401k is? So you're talking about not you, of course, but generally speaking, what we're talking about is we're trying to simplify something that's not simple. And in the process, yeah, sure, some people might do well. There were people that made money on GameStop. It didn't make any sense. People that made money on, uh, was it AMC? 
was yeah. the other one. Didn't make any sense. I had people calling my office saying, I bought this on Robinhood. What do I do now? And I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. It's not really my, my thing here. There's utility in all of it. The problem is how it's used. But it's like people are chasing it. It's almost like mm -hmm. a lottery system, right? Like yeah. you can't predict that that was going to happen. I mean, no. there, are, there are things that can take place here and there where you, you might get lucky. Oh, yeah. But you're going to be more unlucky than you are lucky when it comes to playing those types of things. And you have to be lucky twice, right? It's the same as owning a house. I can walk up to your house tomorrow and offer you $20,000. You're probably either going to give me a very colorful hand gesture or some choice words. Yeah. But until you get the price in which you're looking for, until you hit that sell button on the computer, the value of that thing's irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for whether it's on Charles Schwab's platform or what's that, Acorn. I don't, there's so many now. <laughs> there's a lot. And I think a part of the problem is that private equity is putting a lot of money into fintech. Financial technology is a mm -hmm. huge sector. And if you look at companies like a Robinhood, for example, they talk about assets under management or the value of the company. A large portion of that is actually just from investors. I don't mean investors on the platform. I mean investors in the company, private equity groups. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little misleading in that regard. Mm -hmm. So this leads me to, to turn kind of the conversation over to you as well, Joel, around the marketing, right? Because when you're working with a client any of your clients, you have to know the industry. <laughs> you have to know what's happening in the market, how to help them position themselves so people understand who they are and, and what they represent. Where does social media, kind of some of this, you know, with the apps and stuff, I mentioned, you know, Instagram, but uh, social media uh, could be a really great help, I would imagine, but also you have to help people navigate all that social media in the right way too. Absolutely. Well, I think that it's, it's understanding how it functions, right? Okay. So, when it comes to my financial structure and you know where we where our money is and all that, I know all those things. How it all works and functions, I leave that up to Jake and his team, mm -hmm. right? In a lot of cases, what I see from business owners is them putting money into a lot of things that don't give them money back. So social media is an example where there's billions and billions of dollars being spent on advertising, and and you mentioned ROI, I think, at the beginning. Knowing what your ROI is, like if there's any one thing I could say to somebody, like make sure that you can directly attribute your marketing spend to what is coming in at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. buying clients, right? I mean, you're buying the right. customer. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so there's a cost of acquisition associated to that. It's, there's this, from my perspective, a, a kind of a pie in the sky. Um, you know what? We have to do this because everybody else is doing it. Many times, because everybody else is doing something doesn't mean that you should. Making that carries sure. over to my industry too, just throwing that out <laughs> oh, there. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, being present and making sure that you have a presence there and doing this. Absolutely. I think there's a component of all of that that helps to legitimize any business. But spending thousands of dollars and hoping that something positive is going to happen at the end of the day based off of you spending that kind of money is probably the biggest, I mean, not just social media, but any kind of digital ads altogether it's one of the biggest mistakes I see business owners make. Yeah. Well, and I think you actually helped me quite a bit with that because I remember when we first started together, you know, being a business owner, you were doing, your CEO, you're the head of HR, it's you are, marketing. in my case, the advisor, you're the host, right? <laughs> I remember I asked him, I said, are we doing enough on Facebook? Or maybe this was you and I think Holly. Um, he said, Jake, how many times have you looked for a financial advisor on Facebook? Right. And I had never thought of it that way. For me, I just thought people go there. That doing. means I have mm -hmm. to be there. And I could have just thrown money out the window and it would have had the same effect. And to that point real quick, so many other, the way social media works, right? We're getting bombarded with people oh. who say, uh, you must be doing Absolutely. this. TikTok. You, yeah. Experts. Yeah. Look at TikTok right now. I mean, so I, I read a, an amazing statistic recently that was related to TikTok saying that they now have more volume in, in terms of visitors to TikTok than Google has in daily searches. What? So it's the, it's the most viewed site. I wish I was surprised. That's the thing that upsets me Is there me the a most. place for a business owner there on TikTok? Depends on the business owner, yeah. right? If you're in entertainment or mm -hmm. uh, if you're potentially a restaurant, I mean, I think there are some things that may be affiliated to that. I don't think that Jake's going to be dabbing on TikTok anytime soon. <laughs> I hope not. I'd like to see that. Oh, God, no, you don't. <laughs> I think that's the hard part, though, is you have, to both of your points, gurus. It's the same thing. Everyone thought they were an absolute genius in 2005 and 2006 if they bought a house or sold a mortgage. You can probably count on both of your hands people you knew that did that. Mm -hmm. Now it's just on TikTok. 
buy my coaching program. I'll teach you how to be a millionaire in apartments. Or how many have I sent you on a weekly basis? Oh, it's crazy. I mean, everyone can apparently make you a millionaire no matter what. Right. And so for those folks who are scrolling uh, on a Saturday morning or Sunday morning or laying in bed at night and they're, they're in a pinch financially or their business isn't growing quite as rapidly as they want to and they're getting bombarded with all these different messages, sometimes they're making these choices and going with that quick fix. Right. <laughs> right. Or they, so they think. And then, you know, to your point earlier, so somebody else has to come in and undo that. And I would imagine marketing the same thing. Yeah. You spoke to that mm -hmm. when it comes to financial planning. Like, you know, sometimes we have to go in and clean up what somebody else did. Marketing-wise, yeah. I'd imagine you have to do the same. All the time. Just got off of a call in the in the parking lot as I pulled up yeah. for um, a lady that has started a, a very unique school system. And uh, there's quite a bit of investment that's gone into it. And the questions that she was asking me, if I were her, if I were her marketing agent, I would be very upset at myself where mm. she's like, do I own all of my assets? What am I getting for ROI? How am I doing on Google? I mean, these types of basic questions, she's like they, they won't answer any of it. And I get that. God, I'd have to say daily, honestly, mm -hmm. in terms of people asking us questions and what, what should we expect? Um, and a lot of times, like many times they don't own their own assets. A lot of people don't know they don't own their own website. Like, it's just, it's crazy what's going on in the world out there. And it's just because, A, people are unaware of how it works. So they, there are people out there that are willing to take advantage of that. And in my experience, it's like 60 to 70% of all marketing providers are out there just taking advantage of, I have to use this word, but it, it feels bad, but it's the truth of the ignorance of mm -hmm. how it functions. When we as professionals are relying on having other po folks, when they say they're gurus or they're experts mm -hmm. at it, or they can, or they can deliver that, that, that is the right thing for us because we're, we're managing to your point, the other aspects of our business that either is our sweet spot and what we're born and, and good at doing, yep. or, you know, we have to find and rely on other professionals to help us. It's it, the interesting thing. If there's another, like, just takeaway that I, I hope the listeners will walk away with is that ask for examples where ROI was lifted. Like ask for those types of things in order to show that these people are capable of doing it. Not impressions, not clicks, mm -hmm. not all these marketing terms. I gave you X. What did you get in return? Mm -hmm. Let me know before I move forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's the hard thing about both of our industries. And in a way, maybe yours too, right? Is we have to take the quantitative and make it qualitative. And some, sometimes the other way, right? I mean, you have to take an image or an ad banner or whatever it might be and convert that to a number, which then leads towards spending another number on more of them. So navigating that dynamic, I think, and taking that person from, let's call it ignorance again, right, to a place where they can function effectively. You don't have to be a master. I don't want to know marketing on a mastery level. That's why I have Joel. I don't know how to host a radio show and people would get tired of hearing me. I'd probably say something that was just, you know, out of line at one point and it would go a different direction. <laughs> so it's really, to Joel's point, finding that person who can be honest with you even when it's not fun. Mm -hmm. You're right. I, you know, we can call it radical transparency. I think Ray Dalio said yeah. that in his book, Principles. Yeah. There's conversations I have with clients, not fun. Mm -hmm. But they're necessary and they trust you. And they respect you. They trust you and they know that they can expect that from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you recommend for new businesses, Joel? Like what's the most important piece of advice when it comes to new business? Don't fall into the trap of uh, being promised at all, right? It is, it is hard to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, you you get to live your passion, which is fun, and you get to 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 express your ways in in, in a way that otherwise you wouldn't if you had an employer. But it's not going to be easy. And know what you're spending your money on. If you get that feeling in your gut that you're not getting what you want out of what you're spending, ask the right questions so that you don't get taken advantage of. Um, well, I think you had to have that conversation with me, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there were there were companies I was using in the past where. I just thought, okay, well, this is how marketing goes. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes it takes someone to shake you and go, no, th this is not how this is they supposed to work. They might tell you that it is all day long, but I'm here to tell you the straight story. I hear it with attorneys, yeah. marketing professionals. Yeah. I mean, you name it. I'll do a quick, quick story because now we're running out of time. 
like Google as an example. It comes across that Google as this all-knowing entity that has some secret sauce and, and nobody understands how it functions, but yet it's a part of our daily lives. I don't, in terms of how they function from like an organic search, which means when you type in a search and their ad platforms, they are extremely transparent in how it functions. They tell you how you're doing, what you rank for, all these different types of things. I would say less than 5% of the time do I see a business owner, executives, large companies know that there are these components that exist where Google says, here is where you rank. Here's how you're doing over the last three years. Here's, here's everything you need to know about how to be better with us. And people don't use it. And it's there. It's available and it's, it's transparent. And it's free yeah. and it yeah. costs nothing. You have your metrics. You have your KPIs, your key performance indicators right in front of you. If, if a business owner hasn't heard of Search Console before, that lets you know that you're in a situation that that is not good. That's something that should be looked at on a consistent basis because it gives you so much data. And that's any size business. Any size. Yeah. If you have a website, you should have Search Console. Hmm. Holy cow. I wish we had, you know, booked another hour with you. Too. <laughs> I have nowhere to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. I'm I am blown away and and inspired by both of you. Not only the relationship that that's clearly evident between the two of you, but also it's obvious that this is not unique for how both of you operate. Right? We've we spent some time talking about Jake, your relationships with your clients and a long family history. Joel, I know that this particular business is fairly new. What three? Not even three years yet. Yeah, we're coming up on two. Yeah. Right, but the relationships you've had leading up to this decision speak volumes. And I and I'm I I know that. This is just one of many examples of, of how you function with your clientele. I appreciate it very yeah. much. It's it's a relational business just as his is and relationships are everything. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Daryl and I, both of our hands go up. So while this is radio and podcasting, right, I say to my clients over and over again, uh, that's kind of the wreath on our door. What we're really doing here is building relationships oh, with, yeah. with the guests that you invite on right? That's where the ROI is. Build a relationship with that guest and we don't have to worry about impressions and metrics and number of downloads and all that oh, stuff. Yeah. I'm going to help you strategically invite in the guests that you want to leverage that relationship with, either a new one or you want to nurture it and grow it or you want to celebrate like the two of you are doing, right? You're celebrating authentically <laughs> what the two of you have done in, in coming into business with each other and, and supporting each other. That's what yeah. we're here to do. There are people who and perhaps you feel this way now, Joel, too, I can pick up the phone and call that I wouldn't have had access to on a relationship level perhaps two years ago, mm -hmm. right? And those relationships change everything. Yep. You know, when I can call someone and they go, yeah, no problem, I'll take care of it. Yep, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what does that say? I'm going to, I know you're very humble, <laughs> but what does that say about how you're showing up in the world and the people you've aligned yourself with? A lot of positive things. <laughs> yeah. You can do it. You can do it. You mean like... Be, yeah. uh, you know, confident about how that is. Yeah. You know, for me, I, I definitely try and be humble about all those things. I, but I jo it takes Joel reminding me I was me just going to say bit. that. But even Joel has a lot of humility as well. And and so that's why, why I'm asking that question. Because we when we surround ourselves with incredible people who are here to be of service to each other, sure. we're going to get more of that. And then, of course, yeah. when we're laying awake in the middle of the night or we mm -hmm. wake up and there's some problem that we hadn't anticipated, where we think, oh, my gosh. I can give so-and-so a call. I'll know, I know they'll be here for me. I had to take a personal leave for almost a year, and I'm only four years in this business. The entire community rallied around with me and kept my business alive because yeah, I fantastic. couldn't be here. But it's because I care deeply about the people I work with. I've been lucky enough. My son is uh, applying to the Naval Academy and uh, to West Point, and we've been able to go. I just recently came back from the Naval Academy. The community that surrounds those types of, of I guess, organizations, those, those academies, is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. And we are doing our best to help him understand and say, invest in that, invest in your relationships more than you do just about anything else, because that will lead to opportunities down the road for you in all sorts of different ways. And it's, oh, it's yeah. built that way. Absolutely. It's <laughs> yeah. built yeah. that way. So let's, yep, nurture it. And it works. Yes. I mean, yep. you know, if, if, if you really do want me to talk about myself, everything that we're talking about now is something that I've had to actively work on and chisel away at for 15 years. You know, you're talking about the average person probably just coasts along through life. Mm -hmm. Fair? I think oh, that's fair. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> For me, you know, when my friends were out playing football and going to parties, I, I was reading business books at the age of 14, I want to say. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was all about learning how to work with people and how to talk to people and listening and you name it. It's, it's all personal development 
is what leads you to be able to have those relationships, in my opinion. Gosh, I keep having those conversations with my youngest. They have two in their 20s. They're doing great things. My youngest and I have been through hell and back together. And even though, you know, he again, he's he's 14 and he wants sure. to do 14-year-old things, I keep trying to just drop those little truth bombs and help him understand how important it is that this is the time of his life that he gets to decide who he wants to be and pick the path to go in that direction. Not that oh, it has yeah. to be you have to know what you're going to do, <laughs> you know, 10 years from yeah. now. I'm not asking you to know if you're going to college or what you want to study or what in trades or whatever, but know who you are. And and oh, yeah. we've mentioned earlier, again, my, my biggest battle is getting him off, you know, the games and the phones to, to look up long enough so that we can have these conversations. You could throw it in the pool. That would work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Listen, I haven't thrown in the pool, yeah. but I have done other versions of that, yeah. that, you know, for the first two days are life threatening. And then, wow, I've got my kid back. Well, you know, and I think I just had this conversation with Holly recently. Um, Shout out to Holly, who's in the I know. The green room I don't right know now. if she's uh, listening. She to better this. be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bringing back the idea of the lemonade stand, right? Yes. I mean, I remember distinctly sitting out in my front patio. This is probably one time I did this, but you remember it. Mm-hmm. And selling a good and service for a price. Yep. I mean, for me growing up, I had the benefit of growing up in a family where it was entrepreneurial. Yep. My mom wasn't. My dad made up for it. I think he now <laughs> still has 20 something businesses. To take that and let it blossom into something over time is really powerful. And I think giving kids the tools to make that change, I I think people are trying. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you talk about TikTok or Instagram, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. The problem is they're not given the tools, right? They think that opening an LLC is how you just make it in life, Right. right? Or you just put yourself on TikTok and do exactly. silly things, Gavin. Thing, yeah. Oh, and for some people, they might make $10 yes. million. A year. There's a kid that opened toys and made $22 million a year, Amazing. right? Ryan, I think his name. <laughs> but, you know, for me, I look back, I was thinking about this on the way over here. When I was a senior in high school, I remember distinctly there were so many issues with bullying that we had to get rid of class shirts. Seniors were picking on juniors, juniors on freshmen, you know, you name it. I think you guys have all been there, right? This was kind of a, a cue into my future, right? I, you know, I was reading books about how to be an online entrepreneur. This is when the internet was first coming around. I wanted to have a, I remember it was a 2004, remember Lamborghini Gallardos when they came out? Of course. I wanted a yellow one. That would have been the most pretentious possible thing. (laughs) But I remember my friend Alan and I took it upon ourselves to not only design, build, but also market a senior class t-shirt that was not only better than the one the school offered, it was all personalized, it was custom sizing. And then when I did the math, mind you, I'm 16 years old, 18 years old. Our margins were like, $2,500 $2,500 or $3,000. Now, things happened, didn't end up happening. But the fact that I can look back and say that that was where I was senior year of high school, uh-huh. I feel pretty confident about the future. Yes. I was playing football and partying. That's why you are the way you are. <laughs> and I was just trying to pass <laughs> grades. <laughs> and, yeah, and, I wasn't. And, and have as much fun as I could. My wife friends. was the A student. I was not the A yeah, student. Oh, no. My, my kiddo is, is really quite brilliant, actually. And he is an easy, easy learner. And I struggled. Yeah. And so I have to help, try to help him remember he, he'll be uh, in high school next year. Like you've, it's super easy now. And I hope that continues, but please be aware that when high school kicks in, you might have to give some more efforts oh, yeah. because yeah. there's going to come a time. It's going to get a little bit more difficult for you yeah. and you want to have the chops. My problem is I didn't put in more effort. I had a math tutor. I work in finance. I had a math tutor for five years. But, but look at that, right? That's I, I like to think I'm pretty good at what I do. Yeah. But and that should be – if that's not a motivational quote on some wall <laughs> right. somewhere at some point, I don't know what is. I think that, you know, briefly, I think some, something to think about. When you go into high school, it's just like anything else in life, in business or anything else. Depending upon what it is that you want to do, you're now competing, right? right. Whether it's to get sure. into the college you want to get into or to get into the football team, basketball team. Mm-hmm. You have to compete. And uh, something that's helped my son a lot is for me to say, you know, just know that whatever you're doing, you're playing video games, you're doing whatever you do. I want you to think every moment that you're doing, making the decisions that you are, what is your competition doing at that moment as well? Oh, I love that. That mm-hmm. seems to have been a good yeah. mindset for him. It carries yeah. over to everything. Yeah. I mean, I have friends, you talk about the military, you know, I have friends that were uh, in the SEAL teams and, you know, you read books about like Jocko Willink is a great one, right? He says, you know, if at every moment you're lazy, your enemy's training to kill you or something, right? right? And of course, that does not carry over to Scottsdale, Arizona, <laughs> depending on where you live in Phoenix, maybe. But to Joel's point, it's a great motivator. Yep. I mean, it doesn't matter. I've had conversations with my wife. I've been doing on and off um, mixed martial arts for a couple of years now, and I get beat up every day, every day. But our kids are going to do it because they have to know what it's like to be yep. at least up against something. Mm-hmm. Right. That's powerful. Yep. Hmm. 
This has been a thrill for me. I hope you've enjoyed sharing yeah, today yeah, as well. Well. I, yeah, and yeah. I, I think I did the best I could to make sure we get all, all the little uh, snippets in that we all thought we might want to share with our listeners today. How can folks get and stay in touch with you? What's the, what's the you know, if someone's listening and they're like, gosh, I really would like to get to know them better. I think they can help me with whatever it is that they're, they're needing. Um, what's the point of entry for them? Uh, easiest way for me, if you really want to chat with me, is to go to LinkedIn and uh, okay. connect with me there. Mm-hmm. Um, just leave a message associated to it. And uh, there's there's only two Joel Cohens. One of them is a, an Academy Award winning director. Then that's me. actually who I thought one. you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So C O E N Joel J O E L Cohen. C O E N on LinkedIn. That's fantastic. And True North Advisors LLC. Yeah, let's see. Your website is True North dash hyphen. or hyphen. Yeah, advisors. Uh, advisors. Is that hyphen? Yep. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Say dash. Same thing. You can say dash. <laughs> okay. It's like ampersand. I don't think anyone knows. No, now right? It's a now it's a hashtag. Yeah. Right. Back in the day. Okay, yeah. great. So connect with Joel on LinkedIn. And Jake, how about for you? LinkedIn is definitely not my best way. Okay. Um, I would say my website, which is rosevestfinancial.com. Um, rose like the flower, vest like investment, financial.com. And for us, just give us a call. Shoot, me, shoot us an email. And okay. if we can't get someone situated, we can at least get you on the right track to someone who can. I love it. Any last parting words that you really want to make sure that our listeners hear? Or if, if I did forget anything. I don't think we forgot anything. I just want to express gratitude no, towards this guy and to, to Karen, Daryl, hiding in the corner over there. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, his head's been nodding the whole time. He, I'm sure he'll share what he learned because he learned something every time. And I can always tell when he's emotional listening. It has to be a cool position to be in, yes. listening to people super, talk all the time. Super cool position. Yeah. Yes. I'm just sad that he's taken my job because now I'm in the other building. Well, I'm listening to people in a different way. But <laughs> uh, thank you again. It's been a joy. And Holly, uh, thank you for helping wrangle the cats and make sure we made this happen. Cats and, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, meet cat being me. Right? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I, I she, She's apologized when we connected this afternoon. I'm like, no, I'm so glad you were stalking us and staying in front of us. I didn't feel like that way at all. You've been listening to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona. Some media leans left, some lean right, and we lean business. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. <laughs>